Okay, so Les, good evening, uh, or good afternoon even. Um, welcome to In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo. Uh, I am also known as the Urban Birder. And this whole occasion is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics, so thank you very much. Um, the first thing I want to ask you, Les, is how are you and where on the planet are you? Ah, well, I'm, I'm actually really good today. Uh, uh, I'm in the United States at the moment. I'm actually Canadian, uh, and I, I, I have two places. I live up in Canada, but uh, I'm married to an American, and so we have a place down in the United States. And where that is, is uh, Southern Oregon. And uh, it's, uh, if I can flip it around, I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful spot. I, uh, I'm sitting, uh, I'm just sitting in my, my shaded area of the yard. I've got a larger field down there. And apropos as per this conversation, uh, um, I know this is, you, you definitely, your interests are in, in natural, nature as a general sense, but as a birder, um, I've got 27 nesting, uh, 27 feeders, and I think uh, 14, maybe, maybe 15 nesting boxes, uh, and many of them are active. We're in the spring of the year here, so I've been out, I've got a, a new uh, pair of uh, nesting birds that I can't identify, so I got photographs of them uh, just yesterday, and I got to go online and see what they are. Well, uh, but that's where I am. I'm in Southern Oregon right now, just uh, just at my at my place here. Les, you may not need to go online. You may even just have to show us the pictures, and perhaps, especially we've got a couple of people from the states here, may recognize your bird for you. Ah, well, I'd have to go run and get it off the camera, but uh, now that I know that, that's actually a great idea, um, <laughs> and that's what I tend to do. I, I I'm I've got. Um, you know, I, I did this a lot in Canada and growing up and everything, but but here in Oregon, uh, of course, I'm I'm just given a whole new flock of birds that that I'm not familiar with, and it's been really wonderful. I've got a sharp shin hawk that comes down and takes advantage of my bird feeders, but the cycle goes on, uh, and lots of golden finches and and uh, um, spotted towhees. Um, we've got the red-tailed hawks and. Uh, Scrub jays, stellar jays, juncos, sparrows, uh, bluebirds, western bluebird. We've got, I've got them uh, nesting just down here. And now this, and, and some wrens, house wrens, but I've got this new pair of birds, crazy sound. And I've got some photographs of them yesterday. So I've got to figure that out, but yeah. yeah I love to so know I come by it all out pretty honestly. Good. Um, it's funny how, you know, I, I'm from Europe and the way you refer to up in Canada and down in the US, it's kind of quite interesting because it's how we refer to each other in Britain, for example, you know, up north and down south, even though when you think about it, the UK is tiny compared to, you know, the USA and, uh, and Canada. It's funny how people sort of refer to their regions as such. Just a small thing, I thought. Well, I think, I think too, you know, you, um, it depends on where you grew up too, you know. Did you grow up by a body of water? Did you, did you grow up in the prairies? Uh, these things, they, this, they're indelibly imprinted upon you and very difficult for me not to orient myself to water all uh, on a constant basis because I grew up on the shores of Lake Ontario in, 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 uh, in Canada. And so here in Oregon, I'm nowhere near water and that, that has me always feeling a little bit displaced. We have an ocean we can get to. It's quite an, uh, Oregon is quite a, a spectacular state. It has so many different ecosystems from rainforest to the high dry desert to the ocean to temperate forests and everything in between. And uh, from where I am in Southern Oregon, I can shoot out on a, in a spider's wheel, you know, seven different directions and go to seven different ecosystems. It's really quite, quite wonderful. But the up and the down thing, it's pretty hard if you're Canadian not to think of America as a map that you colored when you were in public school. Uh, and yet, if I were to be in uh, Northwest Washington, I'm probably equally as high as I grew up in and over in Toronto, Ontario. So it's all relative, I think, in the end. Yeah, I'd love to know what's calling in your background as well. I'm not, uh, even though I can put me in North America, I can recognize a lot of things, but when it comes to bird songs, because I'm not there all the time, maybe some of our American friends can help us on the calls you're hearing. Um, there, will, there will be a few during the course of this conversation, I'm sure. They're a little quiet this morning, but uh, it's getting hot, so they're settling back. Yeah, so tell me about you as a young guy, young boy, Les, even. I mean, were you always kind of immersed in nature? No, you know, that's the, I think the, um, the myth, the mythology of, for those who, who aren't familiar with my work, uh, which I suppose the most um, known, if you will, would be Survivor Man. Uh, but 
the myth would be that, you know, I was raised by wolves and, you know, that kind of thing in the deep dark woods of Canada. But no, I, I grew up in, a, in the West end of Toronto in the, in the suburbs, uh, you know, very, very white bread, boring suburb area. Um, and yeah, it was kind of, yeah, very uh, low, low income existence uh, with my family, rather dysfunctional family. And then, and then not much nature there. Now we were on Lake Ontario. So the, na- the kind of nature that I grew up with was that kind of inner city nature, but it's still there. And that's, this is a thing that I, I, you know, when you're a kid, you could go to the abandoned field behind where they repair the trains, you know, in the big yard. And you're, you're watching praying mantises, you know, and monarch butterflies and snakes and all kinds of things. And when you're a kid, that is, that might as well be the Amazon jungle. It certainly was to me. So my influence in the home was not through my family. So no mentorship, no guidance into nature whatsoever. But the biophilia, if you will, that I know is alive and well with me, uh, was always burning there. Inside, it was watching Jacques Cousteau on television and Tarzan movies. And for those of you who know my work as Survivor Man, if anything, Survivor Man is the perfect hybrid between Jacques Cousteau and Tarzan. That's what I wanted to be. It's kind of what I became. But in the real world, what fed my, uh, nourished my nature desirous soul was, you know, going, going behind the train tracks and going to the little Humber Creek, uh, polluted as it probably was, but it didn't matter. There were still the odd blue herons and, uh, you know, deer and fox and things like that. So even in the inner city, I I didn't bring it with me because I wasn't planning on that kind of sort of promotional, but I just wrote my first children's book and it's called Wild Outside. And it's all about getting kids out in nature. We just released it. uh, And um, in it, I talked to kids about the fact that their natures, you know, even if they grow up in a bachelor apartment or something like that, but still there's always some nature somewhere in a city. So for me, I would go behind Queensway Hospital, for example, where they had the last remnants of the northern, where exists, I hope, hopefully still, the last most northern remnants of the northern Carolinian forest. So that's where you get your, your vines, your grapevines and things like that. And that was behind a hospital in a little area that was kind of like nobody cared about anymore sort of thing. So that's where I got my nature. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't going on canoe trips with my dad. It wasn't joining the Boy Scouts. It wasn't doing any kind of, ex, you know, exchange student thing out in Kitimat, BC. Nothing like that at all. I, we didn't have any money and we didn't really have big nature. So I found it where I could. And I found it in these, in these, in these different waste yards in the backs of uh, industrial buildings. Yeah, well, I, um, I can share that, um, that feeling with you because that's kind of how I got into nature with no one to help me and no mentor. But one question is, do you believe in Yeti? <laughs> right. You're going right there, are you, David? I'm going all wow. the way there. Oh, yeah, right out of the starting gate. Well, let's hook him in now. I do. I believe in Yeti. <laughs> this is like becoming a Bigfoot day because I got a phone call this morning from, uh, for those who don't know, I'm a, I'm a musician and I'm a singer-songwriter. I've got seven albums and I'm, I'm always uh, recording and I've got a producer down in Los Angeles uh, and he just called and goes, have you seen the new special on Sasquatch on Hulu? And it's it's a little three-part series about some people who were murdered and they think were murdered by Sasquatch. And it's up in the Emerald Triangle, the pot growing Mecca of North America sort of thing. And um, uh, so I'm not gonna answer that question with a yes or no, do I believe? Uh, it all depends, David, on how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. So if we are, if that conversation, let, let me, let me, we have the time, so let me, let me, you know. Yeah, enjoy yourself, so indulge, indulge us. Yes, I'll indulge you a little bit. Uh, well, you get me early in the morning. I need a beer for this conversation. <laughs> uh, good, good Guinness would work well. Uh, you, if, if you met me at a party and see, for those of you who don't know, I did a 10 part series called Survivor Man Bigfoot. And it's really being held up as, as kind of the most respectable series on the subject. It was 10 one hour documentaries. I've done two since then. And if you meet me in a party and say, oh, do you believe in Bigfoot? Well, I have to see where the, your tone is coming from. Because most people ask that question. It's an honest, innocent question to ask. Do you, so do you believe in Bigfoot? It's one way to ask it. But if you come up to me at a party and go, dude, do you believe in Bigfoot? The conversation's <laughs> over. I'm not even going to have the conversation with you. But if you ask me, do I think it's possible that a upright, large, bipedal, 
human, you know, hominid species with intelligent, very much intelligence and capabilities of dealing with the natural world and certain attributes that we can recognize physically, but then some go beyond that. And if you have a really open mind about the plausibility of it, sure. Yeah, I would say the plausibility is there now over in UK, the UK, perhaps. Uh, and, and, and I don't mean this as a like it, it sounds bad, but you don't have the nature we have in North America. So or, or let's say even Siberia. But you get out there, I, you know, take I take it places in the United States. It's pretty vast. If you looked at that and said, yeah, but could a highly intelligent hominid species of, of how many, um, say a dozen, live in that valley? Well, yeah, they actually could, physically speaking, physically speaking. So there's a, it's a rabbit hole. It's the way I like to describe it. This is a slippery slope leading down a rabbit hole that is coated with ice and grease. And it goes off into a hundred other rabbit holes. And it all comes down to how open is your mind to the possibilities and concepts beyond the human ex our human existence. You know, biologists can say, well, they find new species all the time. Yeah, but let's be honest. Usually it's a fly or an ant or yeah, a caterpillar, but, you know. Yeah, but the thing, ahead, is, the thing is, Les, the thing is, the thing is, I mean, look, the, the mountain gorilla, which is huge, was not discovered until, what, 1904 or something? The Okapi, the relative of the giraffe, that was found in the early 1900s, late 1800s. You know, we don't know anything in terms of what's out there. You know, we don't, we can't tell how many whales there are in the sea, and they are massive. We can't even find our relatives in the same street. So that makes me think, well, why can't Yeti exist? I mean, you look around the world and you have all these records from various places, remote places, and also, you know, sort of random places around the world of the same kind of creature. Even, you mentioned UK, even in Scotland, there is the legend of old gray man in the Cairngorms, which again, fits that kind of identikit, sort of Yeti, abominable snowman, Sasquatch type uh, creature. And I'm always, I personally think, you know, that that has to, there must be something out there that exists like that. Why not? Well, yeah, if, if you, you know, th this is the thing, it's really simple to be in an armchair, you know, be an armchair quarterback or what have you, and to be in a city and never go out, venture out or to go fishing two weeks of every year and say, I've never seen anything or hunting a month out of every year and say, I'm up on those mountains all the time. I never really all the time. All the, you're up there all the time. How, how often? It, well, we go hunting two weeks every year. Yeah, that's not all the time. <laughs> and, and then all those times, did you ever see a cougar? No, you know, it, it's, it's so you have to it's it's intriguing because you can give it as you said you know you can look at look at the history of it we have hundreds of indigenous cultures that describe the exact same creature and they're not connected we have over 150 names for it and we have thousands not a dozen not two dozen we have thousands of anecdotal references albeit uh that reference this through sightings rock throwings screams footprints hair samples you know, so it goes down, like I said, it goes down quite the rabbit hole. And anyway, I'm open to everything. So for me, it doesn't, what I, what I like to say is, let's say we proved it tomorrow. They proved it once and for all. There it is, and then it comes out. And there's such a thing as Sasquatch, and we, we, it's accepted now worldwide. Or let's say aliens land in New York tomorrow. Well, either way, I'm still going to want to go to want to have a cold Guinness tonight and dinner with my wife. It's not going to change who I am or what I do. And so I'm kind of like, why not? You know, I happen to be a nature nut. I happen to spend a lot of time in the wilderness and I've had some really crazy and strange experiences. So so that puts a little fire under my butt. Absolutely. Down this particular particular subject. But the question that the question is for me is not, you know, do they? exist are it's more well then if so what exactly are they because if they can be this stealthy and this intelligent and remain this hidden and yet kind of get accidentally caught thousands of times one way or another by visually sightings or what have you or interactions then what are they what are their attributes and that's what i think is the most fascinating part of this subject matter their attributes then you look at all the anecdotal references you draw up a chart you see how many times people have had rocks thrown at them you know, boulders too big for an ex-convict who's hiding in the woods to, to throw kind of thing, or sightings, put all that together. 
and uh, you get something pretty intriguing at the very least. Okay, so I'm left none the wiser. <laughs> but, um, but do I believe? No, because it's not about belief for me. Okay, now for me personally, I I come from a city, and I think that as an urbanite, especially as a kid, you're fed all these stories about if you go into the woods tonight, you know, you you, you bred. So you bred, you, you, you live your life thinking there's, there's danger in the woods. So if I was in Canada now and I had to walk into the woods or forest on my own that night, I'd be petrified. I think I'd be petrified. I'd be afraid. I'd be thinking, you know, I, I, I'd be scared. Would I be right to be feeling that way? Or, you know, is there any truth in, 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 in my feeling? Well, instinctually, it would be correct, wouldn't it? Uh, petrified, no. Uh, Cautious? Yes. Like I would suggest that, you know, well, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness. I, all of that breaks away to nothing. And I, like, I'll walk, you know, without a flashlight through the dark woods in, in the middle of the night, but not at first. It takes me, you know, for, for example, even on a camping trip or something, it takes me three nights to, to shed all of my apprehension. Uh, apprehension for what? Well, I don't know. I guess, I guess a, 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 um, an angry bear or a skunk or or moreover than anything the unreal you know maybe even unrealistic fears of just creepy stuff you know too many seen and i don't even watch horror movies but any horror movies i've seen that sort of creepy feeling you get but it's it really dissipates after time it really does and and i mean i lived in the woods for an entire year once in northern canada far far up in the north um and a whole year in a little tiny log cabin and you become completely immune to those fears. They, they, they shed away, uh, but it's all about familiarity. So at first, yes, in, instinctually, you'd be absolutely right. But, but you'll, even if you come from the UK or somewhere else and you have no experience in the wilderness, it's a little story. I was teaching a, a wilderness uh, survival and nature course and I had my sister with me. Same background, same upbringing, everything. But she's not a nature nut. And uh, so I had her with me on this course. I said, come on on the course and you'll see. So she's in the front of the canoe and we're paddling along. And I looked down into the forest and it was a black spruce forest and it was very dark. And I said, oh, that looks awesome. I'd just love to go in there and get lost in there. And my sister, without even hesitating said, that terrifies me. And it really made me think like, wow, like all I wanna do is go in there and all she wants to do is paddle the canoe away from it. So it's just this familiarity thing, but should we be afraid? No, absolutely not. I mean, heck, we all, I mean, the cliche, it's a lot more dangerous for any one of us to go driving on the freeway to this afternoon than it is to walk alone off into the woods, you know, right now, way so, more dangerous. So where, where does this fear come from? What, you know, where does it stem from all this, this, these stories that make us afraid of, of being in situations like that? Well, I mean, for one, the, the realism in it would be our own instincts. I mean, last night we were talking about phobias and the root of most phobias other than really quirky ones are, um, are, are based on our, our, our very primal, you know, we were afraid of spiders because they can kill you, afraid of snakes because they can kill you, afraid of heights because you can die if you fall off. You know, the, a lot of the phobias are based in a very primal reality of how, how it took us to, how we had to survive. Uh, and then, sorry, t tell me a question again, because I just lost my train of thought of where I wanted to go with that. The question was, you know, where does this come from? What, you know, what part of history dictated? Because we, right. we were originally yeah. creatures living in the world anyway. So how come we suddenly become afraid yeah. of it? No, I love that. And, and so I'm, I'm actually developing a pitch for a new show right now uh, called uh, The United States of Monsters. This company asked me to. to and, it's, and it's exploring the legendary creatures and monsters of all the small towns of the United States. And uh, so within that, where do these fears come from? Well, for example, you know, werewolves or even just wolves in general, why do we have such a hate on for one of the most, most beautiful creatures on the planet? This is a, a, a creature that, that writes environmental wrongs just by being there. Why such a fear? Well, part of it is we go to the Black Plague. And one of the things that used to happen during the Black Plague was that people would take their dead bodies and running out of room to bury them, dump them at the edge of town, on the edges of forests. Well, what happens then? Hungry wolves find dead carrion laying around and they start to eat. What do we get out of that? 
Little Red Riding Hood and werewolves. Uh, and so we create this, this, this mm, ambiance, if you will, of, of these fearful, horrible creatures. Now, has a bear ever killed and eaten a person? Yes, it's happened. Has a cougar or mountain lion? Yes. Has a, you know, it, it, yes, these things happen in natural reality, but they're so exceedingly rare that be, just because one gets the headlines, it's like, yeah, but compare that to the millions and millions and millions of hours of human time spent in black bear territory to this one rogue black bear who was taught to eat around campsites, who then couldn't get food, becomes a little bit rogue, and then goes after some food in the garbage, is surprised by somebody, kills that person, and now black bears are all killers, right? And, and, and so the, uh, what I wrote, I wrote a book called Survival, it was a manual on survival, and I said, let's look at predators. In my world, there's only about a half a dozen apex predators, animals that would seek us out to eat us. Bengal tiger, African lion, great white short, uh, shark, great white shark, saltwater crocodile, polar bears. Uh, these creatures, these animals, if they see you and you're on a, yeah, you, you might get eaten, but black bears and cougars and grizzlies and so, and most sharks want nothing to do with us, really nothing. So the, 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 the things that make us so afraid to go into the woods at night, I think most of it is, is, uh, is story based unrealistically, you know, and, and I could go on to a conversation about what media does for us, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, we can get onto that actually. But, um, you know, you talk about grizzlies. I mean, I've got a brown bear on my shoulder and I remember going yeah. to Finland and walking through this forest with my guide to a hide, to sit in this hide for 18 hours to wait for bears to come. And I remember walking to the hide. He told me beforehand, go to the loo now because you're not going to go for the next 18 hours because if they smell you, they won't come near you. I walked walking through this wood and I was absolutely petrified. I was thinking, I could, I'm bear meat. I could be picked up any moment now. Um, and I was petrified. And I remember sitting in this hide and seeing that particular bear on my shoulder walking towards us at some point. And my guide was on the floor sleeping and he was snoring loudly. And every time he went, <laughs> the bear looked up because around the area was baited, but he looked up and he started walking towards where the source of sound. And the hide that we were in, had three sides wooden and the back was tarpaulin. So the bear could have just strolled in. I was probably one of the scaredest I've ever been in my life. The bear came within two meters of the hide and disappeared from view because it was behind us. I thought, this is it. And I was trying to wake my guide up. He woke up in the end. And even he, despite being a guide and being familiar with bears, I thought he looked worried. Um, and in the end, the bear walked around the front of the hide and found a, a piece of salmon that was secreted there. But what do you do? I mean, walking through a wood in Canada or even in Europe, Northern Europe or wherever bears occur, what should you do in order to protect yourself or minimize the chance of you being that tiny percentage that ends up being eaten? Oh, well, there's, there's several things, really. Uh, depends on whether or not you want to have the interaction or want to see the creature or not. If you don't care about whether or not you see the creature you just want to be safe then just just be a human be noisy and smelly um because you know 99.9999 percent of the time uh these animals want nothing to do with us and they i mean i used to when i did not want to have any kind of an encounter i say i was on a solo survival survival mission somewhere training or learning and survival i would actually blow my harmonica while i while i hiked through thick woods because i knew the sound would you know, potentially just scare everything. I'm like, what's up? Oh, the human's coming and they take off. Um, uh, you get the point, uh, is, is to be noisy. We, I just filmed an episode of a series I'm doing called Wild Harvest. And it's, it's all about local foraging, gathering wild edible plants from dandelions to fireweed to what have you. And it, I bring it into the kitchen and a five-star chef then makes this great meal. It's online, you should check it out, it's called Wild Harvest. Uh, Les Stroud's Wild Harvest. Well, while we were shooting the last episode, a black bear. Uh, and so this is a great way to answer your question because we had to deal with this black bear twice. So on day one, he came up to the cabin we had and he uh, lied around on the grass and rubbed his belly. And I, I was chopping wood 15, 20 feet from him so we could get a photograph of me chopping wood while he's rolling around on the grass. He didn't care. You know, I had an experience with a grizzly bear where, where we were w watching grizzlies and this one grizzly 
she took a liking to me, I think, because every day she'd come over and she tried to come over right to me every single time. And I would just talk to her and I go, that's enough. They named her, nicknamed her Coco. And I was like, that's it, Coco. Oh, okay, Coco. Okay, close enough, Coco. As soon as I did that little change of voice, she, she could see her look dejected. She'd go, oh, and she'd kind of turn. This is a 650 pound grizzly bear. And at one point she rolled on her back and looked up at me like a chocolate lab would do, you know? So there's that. Now, the next day on this shooting this episode, um, we were filming down by the river. We were cooking steaks and showing how to work with these different plants I'd gathered. And I turned and looked and the same black bear that was rolling around on the grass the day before was uh, sniffing about six inches away from our freshly cooked steak sitting on the table. This is tricky. Now, the first time I, on camera, I showed how to handle the, the bear in the grass and I showed how, okay, I can enjoy this scenario. He's not bothering me, I'm not bothering him. This is a safe situation, I have an out and I showed all that. This time, same bear, total different circumstance. And I grabbed the pots and I'm banging them and I'm yelling. And I'll tell you what happened because it was really interesting and it was good to show it on camera. The bear did nothing. He just kind of slowly ambered away. That, and I said on camera, that's not what I want to happen. I want him to take, to take off like a shot. He's not afraid of me. So what do I do? We're down here cooking and we're shooting the last scene of Wild Harvest here and we want to finish, better do dessert. It's our next thing here. And this bear's right there. And like, we're talking 15, 20, 25 feet. Just ambered around. I said, I'll tell you what we do. We leave. It's his home, it's his territory. And when a bear is that confident, it, we're in his territory. If we don't want him or any showing too much, we leave. And that's, that's the thing is, I think as humans, we think we can scare everything away just by getting big and loud. And um, I'll say one more story here, which is cool. I, I, uh, 200 yards from where I'm sitting right now, which means they come down here, I bumped into a cougar, mountain lion. And uh, I was jogging up in the hills as I do. And uh, I always scare up the deer. But then I noticed this deer wasn't running away from me, it was running with me. And that's when I turned and looked and 15 feet away, it was about a 140 pound mountain lion. And he or she, didn't figure it out, was down like this, one paw forward, one paw up, looking at me with its ears down. And so it was stalking me. So I reasoned out the realities of dealing with a mountain lion, get big and get scary and scare them off. And I just, for a second, I looked at it, took that in, and then I just went, yeah, like as big and as loud as I could took off like a shot. So it's the short, that's a long answer, but the short part of the answer is know your animal, know your wildlife, never turn your back on a shark. They, they want, they, they hate seeing your eyes. Never turn your back on a cat. They hate seeing your eyes. In India, they wear masks on their heads backwards to scare away Bengal tigers because they won't attack you from the front. So know your, know your wildlife. And I know when it comes to black bears, they don't want anything to do with us. This particular black bear, huge in the springtime, huge, which is really means he's gonna be massive in the fall. Uh, he should have run away when I tried to scare him off and he didn't even care. And that, that, I knew that was a dangerous moment. So it's always, it varies with the situation for sure. They always say that if you are about to be attacked or threatened by a bear and it doesn't run away, as you say, to make yourself big. And then if you are physically attacked to play dead, I don't understand how you can possibly play dead when you've got a massive right. bear biting the crap out of you and you're scared witless. It depends on the bear. So with a black bear, never play dead, ever. Because a black bear that attacks, which is incredibly rare, uh, much rarer than humans, uh, is not gonna stop. That's his intent. A grizzly, might just be protecting its young, might be just protecting its own kill. It's got an elk over there somewhere that it's buried or covered over with brush. And grizzlies will get bored with you. Uh, with a polar bear, just, just be prepared to meet your maker. Uh, that's the end of it when it comes to polar bear. But uh, with grizzly bears, they're not, they're not man eaters. They don't wanna eat you. So the playing dead ruse works with grizzlies or brown bears. Black bears fighting back works. You know, that said, one woman uh, tweaked a grizzly bear's nose. She tweaked its nose and it took off like a shot. It just wasn't expecting it. You have to look at it this way. Predators cannot get injured. A game animal, a deer, can get injured slightly and recover so long as it hides. But a 
predator animal that gets injured in its face, it can't hunt now. It's not going to eat grass and survive. Deer can eat grass and survive. So anytime, a pre so predators are very worried about getting anything to do with their ears, eyes, nose, mouth injured. You know, they might be able to survive a broken leg from being kicked by a moose or something like that, but they aren't going to survive losing an eye. They lose an eye. That's it for that predator. So uh, being scary yourself as a human, you know, indicates to this predator, like, well, I better be really careful here. As I said, with the exception of uh, those, those apex predators I mentioned, those guys, yeah, saltwater croc does not care if you're big and scary. It's interesting. I've just had a question um, in the, in the um, chat from um, our good friend Joe Seal, who's out there in mm -hmm. the uh, Western US. And we're talk she's talking about The Revenant, um, which is a classic yeah. film with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, for those who haven't seen it. And there's one scene where he gets attacked by a bear and he fights this bear off. And I've yeah. seen you, I've seen you talk about this online. So please enlighten us on that scene. Was the bear attack scene in the movie The Revenant accurate? Well, for uh, um, clarification, great movie. Loved the movie, very beautifully shot. Well worth the watch. Uh, for survival techniques, worst ever. <laughs> just got everything wrong. I think they watched way too much Bear Grylls and it was just all about sensationalizing uh, a lot of crap. Uh, however, the one thing they got very right was the bear attack scene. I, I mean, how do you document or how do you, I, I don't know. But from my experience with bears, the helplessness of, the, of Hugh Glass, which is the character Leo was playing, uh, was I think shown the, the sheer massiveness uh, of the of the bear. I thought they did a great job on that bear attack. Yeah, I think I think if if anybody had ever filmed a realistic bear attack, that was the movie that did it. A lot of other bear attacks are silly and 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 don't work at all. But that scene, oh, it's very, it's all very visceral. And um, I just remember the bear picking him up and throwing him by his back. I mean, yeah, grizzly could do that. You're just a wet rag to a grizzly bear. I mean, uh, the, bear, the, bear, the, bear, the bear came twice, didn't it? Uh, yeah, and that, I mean, this, this is based on the, on the real life story of Hugh Glass, great book to read. Uh, I can't remember the title of the book, but the different stories of Hugh Glass. Uh, so yeah, I thought they got it. I thought they got it quite right. They just got all the survival stuff wrong. And by that, what do you mean? Oh, For just example. all of it. See, the whole thing about Hugh Glass is that he survived this, this horrible situation. Um, but when they were showing him surviving, Leo showing surviving in the wilderness and that, they were just not getting any of the actual survival techniques correct in any way, shape or form. They were going for the visual sensationalism. So for example, he, uh, he made a little shelter and survives and he's freezing in this, sh in this little shelter. And look at that scene. He's in a shelter in the middle of a wind blown field and blizzards and snow. He's like 300 yards from the forest. Nobody ever builds a shelter in the middle of the wind, you know, stuff like that. They needed the look. They needed it to be beautiful. They needed it to be sensational. But I think when it comes to the bear attack, it's incredibly sensational no matter what you, how you portray it. And that's why I think they got the bear attack correct. You must cringe when you watch films, you know, when you think to stuff. So I cringe sometimes when I hear the wrong bird singing in the, in the scene, like for example, uh, Break Back, Break Back, Break Back Mountain. Uh, where they had um, these crows, hooded crows, and they're supposed to be in Northwestern America or wherever they are. Hooded crows are, are, are Eurasian, Asian species. Um, and I remember Yuma, 310 to Yuma, that film with, um, the, I know it's made in the, it was made in the 50s, but it had a remake. And I remember one of the characters, I can't remember his name, he got bitten by a snake and it was a poisonous snake. And they said, um, they basically said, you need to cut your arm off. So they cut part of his arm yeah. off. And like a week later, he's walking around, it's no problem. I'm thinking, hmm, if you get well, bitten by you know, a snake. The, the, the thing is, this, the, it's, it's like, and someone was just pointing out that I saw in the chat room there about the red tail hawk. So, so the first thing, the famous red tail hawk. There, this is how this happened, true story. There was a sound engineer for Hollywood who had the, uh, uh, the sounds of uh, bald eagles. And of course, bald eagles, you know, they do their thing, right? 
Well, they decided for American Westerns, this was not sexy and romantic enough to conjure up the American Wild West. So they got the red-tailed hawk. And they put, and every time you see an eagle, you hear the sound of a red-tailed hawk in every American Western movie ever made for like 35, 40 years. Even to this day, they get that wrong. Uh, and by the way, uh, case in point, anybody who is a um, serpentologist right now just heard you call a snake poisonous. I get that all the time. They're not poisonous. They're venomous. venomous of right? I get correct. And it's like my force of habit from childhood when I, and on a Survivor Man shows, yeah, that snake's pretty poisonous. And then I see the chats laugh. I was like, oh, I called it poisonous again. Darn it. it so, and you know what this alludes to? My wife's a doctor. Can't watch a medical movie. If you're a cop, you can't watch cop movies. If you're a lawyer, you can't watch law, uh, you know, legal eagles or whatever, you know, different law, law movies. And if you're a nature person or a birder or a survival guy, it's the same thing. You try to watch these shows that are supposed to be portraying what you do for a living. And I don't think there's an industry out there that, that likes seeing itself portrayed by Hollywood because they, they, just, they just get it wrong all the time. And yes, the birding is the same. Whenever they get, in fact, so much so that when they get the birds correct, you're like, hey, they got that one right. It's, it's the right birds. So for example, we, we in filming Wild Harvest, we film ambiance of the area right where we are when we're filming the show. We deliver that to my audio mix engineer in Toronto because if I leave it up to Brian, he'll put a whole bunch of bird sounds on an episode that we shot in the fall. And like Brian, it's actually really silent there in October. There shouldn't be any birds chirping there. Maybe the odd blue jay, but that's all I'll give you, you know, and he's got like spring sounds, but he's a Toronto city guy doing audio sounds. And he just thinks, oh, there are less is out in nature again. I need to put some nice bird sounds here. And he, you know, dial up online bird sounds are up, you know, and it's, there we go. And now I've got like the sounds of Southwestern California in my Northern Ontario show shot in October. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, sometimes they do get it right. I mean, I've been watching the series Vikings on Netflix, and I noted that in, in the sort of Scandinavian areas, I'm hearing black woodpeckers, I'm hearing stuff I should be hearing. In the scenes in the UK, I'm hearing birds I should hear. And they're also in, in New England, I think, and I'm hearing stuff that sounds like it should be right. So that's, that's good. But going back to surviving, how, I mean, we watch these programs on TV, and, and you know, it looks quite easy. I mean, it's hard, obviously, but then people seem to survive. But is it that easy to survive? If you are very involved in a plane crash, you're, you're stuck in the forest, you know, what's the first, first thing you should do? If your car breaks down in the desert, what should you do? Well, there's two different questions there. I mean, to, to, to answer the second one first is to say that uh, it's uh, calm down. That's the first thing always, calm down. You have to calm down. You have to remain calm, and you, especially if it's a, tr a trauma, it's an experience that just happened. You dumped your canoe in a river or something like that. Or even if you're just stuck with your car, you have to calm down, and then you have to assess the situation. I have a routine that I talk about, which is the zones of assessment one, two, and three. Your body and everything in your pockets and on you is your zone of assessment number one. Check it out. What do you got? Oh, I got a sprained ankle, and I've got a power bar. You know, um, Zone of assessment number two, what's close at hand? Oh, my backpack with a tent. Zone of assessment number three, what's further on? Well, five miles back, there's a cabin, you know? And when you do this zone of assessment thing, you can do it in 60 seconds. And now you know you have a sprained ankle, a chocolate bar, a backpack with a tent, and there's a cabin five miles back. Now you can make a proactive decision. I'm not really big on passive passive survival. I, I don't think there's, there's not, other than calming down and thinking something through, which I still consider to be active, um, most of the time you need to be proactive in a survival situation. To answer your first question, second now is to say, is it that easy? Uh, no, this is the problem with survival television. This is the problem with the way, you know, after, for those, you know, in brevity, the history is that without Survivor Man, you don't have Man vs. Wild. Without Survivor Man, you don't have Naked and Afraid or Alone or any of these shows. They all spun off the back of the series Survivor Man. It was on first and it was on for three years before anything like that happened because it, it became a hit. And the thing that I dislike the most when I watch these other, these copycat shows and the fact that, first of all, the fact that they're not real, they're, everything is being set up and everything is being filmed and staged and, um, <clears throat> is that they also then try to make it look easy when in fact survival sucks. It's horrible. There's nothing, I, I don't know, it's, it's becoming this recreational activity, but that's really sort of 
just rough camping, I think, in many ways, because real survival is scary, horrible, terrible. And there's only one thing you want to do in a survival situation. Go home. That's it. You don't want to build a better shelter. You don't want to snare rabbits. You don't want to build a fish trap. You want to go home. That's it. Anybody who's ever had to survive will say, I just want to know. Boy, I, you never heard of anybody who actually survived something for real come back and say, I wish I could have stayed longer and made a better A-frame shelter. Doesn't happen. You know, because I've been watching series, um, mentioned, uh, you mentioned a couple or one person's name previously, um, and you kind of think, oh, so all I need to do if I'm in the jungle area and I'm by a river and I'm not sure if the river's clean, is to pour water into my anus so that I can take the minerals from that. Oh, is it that easy? And I, I kind of work, I think to myself, how do I know what vegetation to eat and what not to eat? You know, I think to myself, if I was stuck on a desert island, I'd have to be a vegetarian. How can I kill, you know, I'm from the city. How can I grab something and break its neck and know what bits to pull out? And it's amazing how disconnected actually, we are. I'm interrupting you, David, but you actually, you don't. You know, I mean, when I endeavored to begin the series Survivor Man, my goal was to educate. I, I was a geek. I loved this stuff. I just wanted to teach it. And that's, so my goal was to teach. Well, how do I, well, how do I teach about the Amazon jungle? I'm not from there. I'm from Mimico, Ontario. I go down to the jungle and I spend two weeks training. That's what I do. And I'm very good at regurgitating this on film. That's my job. But first I've got to learn. And that's, that's how you know what you can catch and eat. And it, none of it is that simple. In fact, it's all, you know, if I were to, look at this, the growth in front of me right now behind this laptop, you know, I'm looking at a whole bunch of grasses and stuff. I can see edible plants in there. This is stuff I had to take time to learn, but it's really just a big mess of green to the un, uneducated eye, right? You don't, and some of it could cause me serious toxic, you know, it could be toxic. So no, I, uh, it's, it's not that easy. And um, I think what a lot of the other shows did was they would take a look at, well, to be honest with you, I know in one case, absolutely, two cases, absolutely, they would look at my series, but they would also look at books and they just randomly cherry pick out stuff that sounds cool and might work on camera, you know, but that's not real survival. That's not real education. And so, yeah, my, my goal was always to educate. And that's what I would do. I would spend two weeks training in, uh, you know, Costa Rica or someplace like that. And then I would say, now drop me off in the jungle for seven mm -hmm. days. And I'll film myself completely alone. And I can teach about that plant. And I can teach about, well, that that frog is edible, but that frog will kill me, you know, uh, sort of thing. Uh, and I love that. Um, as I said, I'm, you know, when we when you and I were talking uh, last week there, David, you know, I mentioned about we're all just really a bunch of closet naturalists, you know. I just that's that's really what I'm being and doing all the time when I'm doing survival programming is being a naturalist. Yeah. And I also told you during that conversation that I'm, I'm in Spain at the moment and during lockdown, I got a bike in a, to enable me to get out and, and uh, not be restricted by lockdown rules. But the thing that stopped me from actually drive, riding my bike into the countryside were dogs because the, uh, the sheep are guided by these big mastiffs. And I was thinking, I don't really want to be caught in the middle of nowhere with no one by two dogs. What do I do? And that scares me. Yeah, I'm far more fearful of humans uh, and and dogs actually uh, than I will ever be of a black bear, you know, or a cougar kind of thing. Um, maybe that's my training. Maybe that's my, my familiarity. Plus, I mean, when I was a kid, I got bitten a lot by dogs, so I have this. I always have this nervousness, and and that's that's the difference. I think you know that's one of the things I love about trying to. Like this whole situation right now with the pandemic and the way the world has gone. And, and it's weird because part of my, my passion is coming true. And, but also at the same time, the fear of it, and that is more people are get, taking to nature now because, well, because they can't go cycling in Italy. So they, they're doing something in North America or what have you. But by the same token, there's millions of people doing that no experience, no education. They're leaving their garbage behind. They're trashing the area. And I find this really frustrating uh, because I, again, my safety zone is out in nature, but I've, I've had to learn the skill set to be out there. I would rather be watching a black bear swim across, you know, a little pond area, even though he's sort of coming in my direction, than staring down a couple of mastiffs on my little bike and thinking, how am I, I can't, out, I can't outride these guys. And, you know, so 
I, I empath, em, totally empathize with you when it comes to the Mastiffs. That, well, that well, what, what, what makes dogs so unpredictable compared to a bear? Surely a bear is much more dangerous. Well, because we, we train them. <laughs> they're trained by us. Bears aren't trained by us. I mean, humans train dogs. You know, so you say, well, they're just canines. Oh, they're not really. I mean, they've got thousands of years of strange and cross and interbreeding going on there. And black bear is the same black bear that it was a thousand years ago. You know, uh, so so I think, you know, we can't I think we can't really compare domestic animals to wild animals They're They're just such a, there's a great cartoon I saw of like a, a pair of wolves and uh, there's like there's like this this native person offering them some food and the one wolf says to the other wolf, ah, come on, take it. I mean, how, how bad can they be? And then then you, the next frame is like showing it. It's like like a thousand years later, a poodle all dressed up in Hollywood sort of thing, you know, as to what the wolves have become. So I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't make this comparison of domestic animals to wild animals. I think it's yeah, in many ways. I've never been asked that question before, but I'd suggest it's there's a vast difference. You know, but they resort to their primitive instincts if you let them go in the wild. Yeah, they do pretty quickly, but they're also much more dangerous, more dangerous here than any other creature in local woods and that are packs of feral dogs. I would be very afraid of a pack of feral dogs. I'd come up to a pack of wolves any day, but not a pack of feral dogs. So what would you do? If a pack of feral dogs? Yeah. Back away be- slowly. I mean, I just, I just would, I just, they're, they're, again, you've got radical unpredictability. All of the conversation earlier about bears and that is based on the predictability of a wild creature through study that biologists have done. And then you get the rare outlier, the rare we, rogue black bear that's injured or starving that that attacks somebody in a park somewhere or where they've been leaving food out kind of thing so but with feral dogs it's just radically unpredictable i don't want to deal with unpre- unpredictability even great white sharks i can predict what a shark is going to do when i'm in the water with it and i know keep my eyes on it keep its eyes on me kind of thing don't do this don't do that uh but not with the pack feral dogs have you ever had a close shave or two? Yeah, several. Um, but, but uh, well, the closest shave came from an ungulate, a moose, a big bull moose in the fall, in the season of love. And I came, I did everything wrong. I was out, I was uh, researching an area to teach survival. In fact, I had a big group from Germany coming over to Ontario and I was going to be teaching these these people and it was like maybe 20 people and so I was out by myself doing everything wrong never told anybody where I was going middle of nowhere walking back and there's this beautiful cow moose and she's eating away in the swamp and she looks up at me and she goes back to eating and I thought oh well what have I got to lose so did the stupid thing and I did a moose call and with a, a, a bull moose is like woo, woo, like that and a female moose is like Wah. And then really long, you do that for about 20 seconds. So I did this female call. She looked up and she went back to eating. I turned to walk away, didn't see him at all. 1,500 pounds of bull moose comes out of the forest right beside her with a full rack of antler, chased me through the woods. I ran for all my life. I finally saw sort of a over like an angled tree. I ran up, the, climbed up this tree. I'm at the top of the tree. This is the one time I'll use the, the, the word scared. I was very scared. I was afraid for my life. Top of the tree, shaking like a leaf, no pun intended. And that bull w- moose was at the base of the tree, breaking over other trees, stomping the ground and grunting. And uh, I eventually did, obviously, clearly I got out. Eventually he wandered away a little bit. I jumped out. He resumed the chase. I had to, I, I, I got to a point where he couldn't see me and I slipped into the ice cold water, fully clothed. And I swam my way back to my canoe really silently. And that was the only way I got away from him. So that, that was, I, I would suggest that's the closest I ever came to being attacked and killed by an animal. A bull moose in the rutting season is the most dangerous animal in North America, bar none. They have ripped doors off of trucks. So, and one poor person thought they shot and killed a bull moose. They, they, decided not to dress it in the field. And I guess they had a few guys, they got it up into the back of the pickup. Then they put the cap on the back of the pickup and the moose came too and ripped itself out of the pickup like, like a fish coming out of a sardine can, <laughs> you know? So that uh, I've been chased, uh, I've been, I've climbed a tree to avoid a Bengal tiger in India, been chased by an elk, pissed off elk mom. That was my fault. 
It's all my fault. Uh, and I got bumped by a 20 foot great white shark in a solo cage face to face. And when a 20 foot great white shark bumps you nose to nose, his head is as wide as a Volkswagen. So it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's pretty freaky. But uh, I've, I've been really, I guess I want to use the word lucky, but bites and stings and attacks. I was bitten by a reef shark, but I was feeding them. I was hand feeding gray reef sharks with chain mail on my hands. And yeah, if you're going to hand feed gray reef sharks, these things are puppy dogs. They're like the golden retrievers of the shark world. So he bit me and I think he was as shocked as I was. And I have a little tiny scar, my little, my little scar I get to show off, my shark bite scar. It's like the size of about two millimeters. Uh, and so a number of situations, but I don't, generally get in too many bad situations like that because other than the aforementioned moose i'm not i you know i'm i'm really cautious about it all I, I read up and study and know my animals and my wildlife before i get there so so that i do know what to do yeah have, have you got um histories of uh, getting diseases and being bitten by ticks and things like that so that's the uh, the irony of, of years of traveling the world and being survivor man and filming survival all over in the jungles and deserts and what have you. The only time I get sick is from the food that I eat as I travel. And I've had botulism probably eight or nine times where I was, you know, literally curled up in the fetal position in the bathroom praying to die. It's like, no, I, I'm, I'm okay with dying actually now. Dying would be okay, I think better than what I'm doing, than the pain of botulism sort of thing. But uh, I've been bitten by tick. The last time I, now here I'm in Southern Oregon and the ticks are moving, they're coming over. I, I am fearful of Lyme disease. Um, if I get bit by a tick, I, they have, it's for 35 bucks, you send the tick in, they tell you if it had the Lyme or not. That's a pretty good deal. And I, I thought, I'm gonna try this. I got bit by a tick recently and, uh, I was pretty sure it was the kind of tick that I shouldn't have to worry about. No, sorry, I apologize. It was the tick that I had to worry about, but I was sure that, you know, I, I got him just as he bit me. And so it's highly unlikely. But I, I thought, well, let's see what they do with this. And for 35 bucks, I sent it in. Less than 48 hours later, they, they had the answer for me and said, no, your tick is negative. There's no Lyme disease. So uh, I do worry about that stuff, but that we have, we have ways to deal with it like that. If, if you get bit by a tick in the, in the United States, send that tick in, save it. You know, don't squish it because you're angry. Save it and send it in and find out what's going on there. But um, diseases, no, you know, a waterborne disease. Everybody worries about, you know, what water to drink and so on. Um, I very rarely worry about water out in the wilderness. It's almost always terrific. And even if it did have Jardia, it's a waterborne parasite. You, you might get sick. Seven to 10 days later, you take a pill, it's gone. But dehydration will kill you in three. So as a survival instructor, I'm always big on saying, like, you got to drink. I know it's a swamp, but you're going to die of dehydration if you don't drink. So you've got to drink. And yeah, but I might get sick. Yeah, but you'll deal with that later. You know, you're not going to have to deal with it now. Uh, now, if you're drinking from a creek, you know, on the outflow of a small village in in a third world, yeah, you're asking for trouble. I would not do that. But if I'm walking off into these hills in Oregon right now, I'll drink from any stream out there. And everyone will say, there's Jardia there. It's like, no, there probably isn't. You know, that's a, there's more Jardia. There's 500 cases of Jardia every year in the city of Toronto through child daycare centers. You know, take a pill and it's gone. What is Jardia? Sorry. It's a waterborne parasite uh, and it comes out, uh, well, no pun intended, but animal feces. It's given the unfortunate misleading name of beaver fever, which is really a slag on the beavers. It shouldn't be the such because you can get it from many animals that defecate into the water. So standing water, you drink from it and, and it's just a waterborne parasite that, that uh, uh, you know, wreaks havoc on us, but uh, highly, it won't kill you unless you have other complicating issues but a normal healthy human being can deal with Jardia. Many people live with, third world people live with Jardia in their system all the time. Is it true that if you go to where a horse drinks, that water is safe? No, because it's not true that, that any, and get out of the sun here, uh, that any, any cliche quick saying for nature is not true. For example, eating berries. Well, if the birds can eat it, you can eat it. No, I've watched many birds eat poisonous berries. 
you know, uh, if it's if it's red, you're dead. If it's white, you're all right. Not true. I know many things that are white that are poisonous. You know, so uh, same thing. You know, it, you can drink the water of that. If if they're drinking it, you can drink it. No, I mean animals can just ingest a lot. Well, or they just deal with it. They deal with their own version of the of the disease and the cysts and the parasites. Fantastic, Les. You, I'm. I'm yep, really snowberry. Dennis. Dennis says everyone snowberry. Exactly. Um. I'm really sort of, you're, you're very honest because I'm um, very honest man, you, you, you know, I'm very impressed by you because, you know, when I think of people in your industry, I think of them being, oh, I can do anything, you know, I'm, I'm amazing. But I think you, you, you're very honest in, in even sort of talking about your fears and I applaud you for that. So thank you very much for, for your honesty. Well, thank you. I, you know, look, I've been, I was a rock and roller my whole life. So that gives me that little party trick of being able to speak to a camera and entertain and be entertaining. I, I like it. It's fun. You know, I, I like the stage. I like to perform. But when it comes to nature, yeah, that's when I get serious. And I just, it's always been about, uh, I'm, I don't know why I'm passionate about nature. I don't think maybe many of us don't know why we're passionate about nature. Why is someone passionate about playing the piano? They don't, they often don't know. They said, I don't know. I just always had to play. Um, it's like that for me with nature, not growing up in it too, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when it came to combining my love of creating, creation, creating art and, and the entertainment of that, the, you know, with nature, I could never disrespect the passion I have for nature, the, the nature itself by making a mockery of it or making it a show or making it sensational. To me, nature has so much more drama than our lives and so much more beauty. So I fully embrace what we, you know, they call the biophilia, which is our natural tendency to want to connect to nature. I fully embrace it. And I, I think most of us do without knowing it. And so the honesty part is I'm, I'm no saint, that's for certain. But when it comes to nature um, and teaching survival, well, you know, all right, now it just sounds like I'm bragging on your compliment, but uh, I, I did a series for National Geographic. Thought it was a dream come true. We really want you less, the real you. Yeah, we're gonna have you out there with all these animals and you can watch it now. It's called Alaska's Grizzly Gauntlet. It's on National Geographic. And we ended up doing five episodes. I cut it short at five. They wanted to do some more. And I cut it short because the production company they teamed me up with, normally I'm my own boss, but this was an exception because it was National Geographic. They wanted me to lie about Coco the bear, for example. They wanted me to say in narration that when Coco was rolling on the ground in front of me, showing her, me her belly, that that was a sign of aggression that she was marking the territory and that I better, I better get out of there quickly. And I had to narrate this. And I, and I, using some expletives, told them what they could do and said, um, no, you know, look, and we had big arguments because they wanted to lie about everything going on to do with, with these bears. And I thought, I'm here, here's, here's the way I look at it as an educator, as a filmmaker in this business. I always think somewhere, sometime, there's some 10 year old girl watching my shows and now she's going to do a a presentation for her classroom based on watching Les Stroud. And shame on me if it's a bunch of sensationalized crap. And that's why I quit Shark Week. I did that for three years and I quit because of the sensationalized crap. That's why it didn't work out with National Geographic Wild because they wanted to lie about everything. And thank God that Discovery Channel and Discovery Science Channel, they, were, they let me do my thing. And, and now thank God for YouTube, I can do my own thing. So I thank you for the compliment. Um, I'm not a saint, that's for sure, but you know, I'm probably better with wildlife than I am with humans. <laughs> what's your What's your favorite cat? Wow, good question. I, I'm, you know, probably the Canadian lynx. I, uh, I have a. I'll tell you a story. A Canadian lynx story. Um, I'm just. I'm just. Spoiler alert. It's about a lynx. I was jogging uh, in northern Canada and um, running this little trail home. And something came walking along through the reeds, the bull, the uh, cattails and the bulrushes. And, and I thought, well, it looks like about the size of a one-year-old black bear. It's just going to be a little cub that's probably just been kicked away by its mom because she wants to go have more. So it's going to be a small black bear and it's coming through the reeds. And I stood still and I froze in my spot and I took calm my breathing down. Popped up right in front of me and it was this beautiful Canadian lynx. 
and it was like three feet in front of me and I just didn't move and it looked up at me and I could see its nostrils you know when cats do that breathing thing with their nostrils little fuzzy nostril and didn't she walk towards me to sniff me and I didn't move she started to turn and walk away and I thought oh what have I got to lose here so I bent down I went like you'd call a house cat she turned back sniffed my fingers and then turned and walked away so I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the uh, with links. I'll never forget that moment. You can, you can imagine, you know, it was a really powerful, beautiful moment, Amazing. even though I've been treed by a Bengal tiger, which scared the crap out of me, but. Amazing. And uh, if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding uh, the current pandemic, where would you be right now? Well, let me answer it two ways. This way is if, if I could go anywhere I haven't gone before, I've never truly explored Nepal and the Himalayas. I've been in the foothills, but I've never truly explored a lot of, and I'd, I'd like to go there. But my three favorite places to be uh, are the um, Utah Canyon lands, breathtaking, spiritually breathtaking. It's just unbelievable place. High Canadian Arctic, jaw dropping, and the high Andes of Peru. You know, with when you're looking down thousands and thousands of, of, of meters, it's just, and yet it's green to the top of those mountains. Um, really powerful stuff. But, you know, I think in the end, we're all really familiar with where we grew up. And in the end, sep late September in Muskoka, Ontario, where I, you know, a place I did eventually start to go when, as we got, uh, we got older up in the country, it, it's on fire with the colored leaves. We, we have, I think, the, the greatest coloring of, of the changeover of leaves anywhere on the planet in Muskoka, Ontario. And so also very beautiful place to be. Fantastic. Okay, just to let the Zoomers know, um, on Thursday coming, we've got a guy called Tim Beatley, who's talking about making cities bird friendly. On Monday, the 7th of June, there's Charlie Corbett, and he's talking about 12 birds to save your life. Uh, on Thursday, the 10th of June, at 4.30 p.m. BST, we've got a guy uh, called Dave Gandhi, uh, who's based in Bangkok, Thailand, and he's talking about the birds of Bangkok. On Monday the 14th of June, we've got Tessa Bose. Um, she's a writer and she's speaking about Etta Lemon, one of the ladies that formed the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And to end the series on Monday the 28th of June, 7 p.m., we've got a guy called Joe Shute, who is a journalist, has written a book and it's called, What Do You Know About the Weather? Well, that's coming up, but we've had a, an amazing hour here with Les Stroud, I'm so glad. I was looking forward to this conversation with you for some time, Les. I've never really had a, a conversation with a real life survivalist. And if I was in Canada now, you and I would be best mates. I'd be hanging out with you all the time, picking your brains. You may have to drag me into the forest. I might be a bit nervous, but I'd be very fascinated to learn more. But thank you, you so you, much. You do, know, you do know the best bear bait is, is someone who can't run as fast as you, right? So <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a really interesting experience. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And Zoomers, um, again, thank you for, for tuning in. Hope to see you again in the, in, the, in the near future. I hope you picked up some tips today. So if you are filming any scenes with bears, make sure that you uh, do it properly and get, get Les involved. And until the next time, keep looking up. <laughs>